Right. Are you sitting comfortably? Then I shall begin. It was a dark and stormy night. The men were seated around the campfire. The captain said, Tell us a story. So one of the men began. It was a dark and stormy night. The men were seated around the campfire and the captain said, Hello, welcome to Tweed's Garage, where in this video I'll give you a little slideshow presentation of the first vintage car I purchased before the Riley. Um, uh, unfortunately, I've only got a little bit of video of it, so uh, you'll have to bear with and I'll tell you the story. It was a 1927 Chevrolet Capital AA Roadster, um, purchased from a dealer up in Bicester. Um, wasn't looking for a Chevrolet, it was just a, just a bit different. Um, a bit more advanced than a Model T, um, not as common, well, very uncommon in the UK uh, compared to a, a, an Austin 7 Special. And it sort of had a bit of presence to it and it looked smart and the, you know, the, the wooden wheels were, were, were something we don't see so much in the UK uh, on, on cars of this era. So, um, so yeah, I was, I was quite taken by it and uh, took the good lady up to see it as well and she, she liked it, so that was a, you know, that was a good thing to do. Um, it was a non-runner um, and the dealer told me that the owner said that it was on the road about a year ago. Um, as I've said before in videos, uh, on, I found out on the Riley and I found out on this car, yeah, it hadn't been on the road for years and years. Um, but we managed to get some petrol in it and it started up straight away. It ran for a little bit, but you know, wasn't wasn't great. Wouldn't tick over, um, but did hear it running, and there wasn't any knocking or horrible noises coming from the engine, and it looked like it had been restored at some time and, and kept up in a reasonable condition. So, I I took the chance and uh, purchased it. So, uh, what is it? Well, it's a, it's a based on Chevrolet Capital, um, but like a lot of cars of the time, uh, Rolls-Royce in the UK done it a lot, uh, they, they'd produce a chassis and then the coach builder would put the body on it. Um, and I think it was the same thing. This is an Australian built, built by Holden, who then, be, you know, a part of General Motors now. Um, but at the time they were, were body, body makers, body manufacturers. So I think it was probably done like a lot of this was to get round import duties of cars from different countries uh, of manufacture. So they'd ship in a chassis and then a local bodybuilder would put their own body on or it would all be sent out in kit form and then it would be assembled as a, as a kit to uh, get round the uh, duties. The uh, specification for it was, it's a four cylinder overhead valve 2.8 um, engine, which was unusual at the time for American cars. Most of them were side valve. Um, three speed manual box with a uh, throttle pedal in the middle, which is yeah interesting. Um, you get used to it. Uh, until you emergency uh, have to emergency brake, um, and then it uh, yeah then it gets exciting. So got it delivered to home, and uh, the first job of course was to have a look around it and uh, uh, put the club badges on the uh, on the headlight bar on the front just to just to make it look the part and sort of hopefully uh, encourage it to uh, to behave. Which uh, yeah it sort of yeah, it didn't for a while. Um, so the first thing was to uh, just check the uh, check the valve gear. Uh, take you have to take the rocker cover off. Check the valve gear. Uh, they need lubricating manually um, because this this era of um, the four pot Chevy engine has exposed push rods down one side, which is uh, which is nice. It's it's fantastic when it's running. It's sort of like a stationary engine chugging away. Um, so it's sort of like total loss oil system. Um, down the side so every two I think the sort of uh, the instructions are every 200 miles you had to oil the, the the rocker assembly on the top so there were the felt pads in there to hold oil the felt pad in the top of the rocker cover that you sort of soaked in oil and I think it's sort of some of that vaporized off and 
help lubricate the top. So with that done, uh, sort of delved in and started to try and get it running. Uh, the first thing to look at was the AutoVac, which is a uh, vacuum operated fuel pump. Uh, the way this works, it's a two chamber system um, with vacuum off of the manifold sucking on the inner chamber and uh, with, with that vacuum that sucks up fuel from the petrol tank into the inner chamber gradually filling it up and as that, then when that gets to a certain level there's a, fil uh, there's a float in there that flicks up and cuts off the vacuum and then because there's no vacuum in that inner chamber then the fuel runs from the inner chamber down into the lower chamber uh, where it sits there and is gravity fed to the carburetor. It's a clever little system when it works but if you get any any holes in the inner chamber which is uh, what I had because it had corrosion at the bottom uh, it just won't pull a vacuum so I uh, soldered up cleaned up the bottom and soldered up the inner chamber there was a, an open for some reason there was a pipe open at the top so it never would have pulled a vacuum there whether somebody was using it to top it up with fuel so block that off and then that was running then that would draw fuel up and when, when they're working sort of on tick over they, they draw quite a good amount of fuel up work quite well um, but that still yeah it still wouldn't start it, it was getting starting to cough and splutter and, and sort of getting there um, so the next thing to do was check you know check the timing check the distributor tidied up a few bits of wiring tidied up the uh, clamp for it and there's just a few bits of slack in the in the movement so just, just sorted that out um, so that still yeah still still wasn't happy so next i'll turn my attention to the uh, carburetor a carter crxo uh, updraft carburetor. Um, the first thing I noticed was one of the uh, holes, air holes, was blocked off with a bit of silicon sealant. So pulled that off um, and then tried to uh, adjust the idle, but it didn't make any difference with the idle screw. So sort of delved in, removed the jet, started cleaning the carburetor out. Uh, done a few more improvements, turned up a new um, mixture screw because uh, the old one was sort of badly worn and um, put it back together had a little bit of adjustment but it still it still wasn't running right and couldn't quite think what the uh, what the problem was and then sort of looking into the carburetor through the through the inlet you could see that the tube for the um, main jet was way below the venturi there was a sort of big gap and uh, and when I um have to turn the carburetor upside down once I got it off the car that actual tube fell out and 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 the problem was revealed somebody had put it in upside down which which you can do if you have a look at have a look at it so turned it up the right way made a tool for it to sort of insert it and, and uh, screw it in probably um, and then you can see that the the tube goes all the way up into the venturi allowing fuel to be um, sucked out of the filter bowl or via the jet so put that all back together and um, yeah we got it running and we had idle adjustment and mixture adjustment so um, she was alive yeah so um, what was the next thing and renewed one of the uh, copper fuel pipes to the uh, from from the from the auto vac to the carburetor, so I made some new nipples up, new piece of pipe, new piece of tubing, um, and a new a new vi anti vibration um, coil bent into it. So now it's running. We sort of turn to uh, a new set of tyres because they were looking a bit, yeah, looking a bit dodgy, and there was a mixed batch of tyres on there. Um, so got a set of tyres and then I discovered uh, uh, vintage cars you need flaps as well. So tyres, inner tubes and, and flaps and then these flaps are sort of a piece of rubber, sort of U-shaped uh, circular piece of rubber that you uh, put inside the, uh, inside the tube, against the inside of the tube, between the tube and the wheel just to stop, um, stop it puncturing the... Uh, puncturing the inner tube. Bit of a faff to get them in, but once they're in, that's fine. So um, where I got the tyres from, they, they fit most vintage tyres, but they wouldn't fit them to um, banded 
banded wheels, which is what these are. So you have a, a um, you have the wooden wheel, the spoke wooden wheel, and the spokes go into a, a steel rim, and then over that rim there is a split rim that holds the tire that that slides over and bolts into place. Um, so the, the split rim it's uh, secured by a sort of a clamp bolt at the, at the top. So you undo that. And then you, in America, there's a, there's a tool that you can put in. You can sort of lever, lever it apart and lever it out, and then you can lever it back in again. But couldn't get them over here. Um, so what I found was with a screwdriver and stuff, you could lever it out, and then and then they were flexible enough to sort of pull the rim out and feed it out from the tire, and then then you could sort of um, get the new tire, fit the tube, fit the flap, and um, and then feed in, feed in the, the split rim all the way in, um, but then you needed to sort of expand it inside the tyre to, to, to get the two ends to, to move apart so you could get the, uh, the clamping bolt in to, to clamp, it into, uh, clamp it into position. So I come up with a, an ingenious solution uh, with a sort of a, a piece of wood across the bottom, contacting two points, scissor jack, and then another piece of wood up the top to uh, spread the spread the rim and um, be able to get get it back together and get the clamp bolt in, and yeah, that worked that, that worked well. So I got all four done, fitted back onto the uh, onto their wheels and back down on the ground, ready for a test run. So took it out for a little ride around the block. Uh, yeah, it was okay from what I can remember. Um, quite exciting, like I said, throttle in the middle brakes on the back wheel and um, popping and banging a little bit occasionally uh, but yeah it seemed okay the only thing was the speedo was stuck at 80 mile an hour so so that needed sorting out so that was a little job I'd done um, it's a, a speedo made by AC they're not they're, they're not very good um, and what had happened the hairspring was rusty and there just wasn't enough enough spring in it so the trouble was it, it couldn't counteract the forces of it of the, the the rims spinning round it just sort of hit the stop so i managed to pick up another speedo on ebay and uh the spring on that was okay um but the the, the body of it uh because it was made out of this sort of cast mazak it was all crumbling away the one on mine was okay so i swapped the spring over and managed to get it reading back at zero and, and thought that would be okay um so it was out for another out for another test run a friend come out with me and uh all right so far i got halfway around our little loop circuit it was not far um yeah and just sort of making a horrendous sort of screeching noise coming from the transmission somewhere so had to uh, put it back in the garage and uh, delve around and try and find out what that was. I discovered that the um, the axle is on the on the Chevrolet is very similar to the axle on the Riley. So it's like a, a T axle. So you've got your back axle with a torque tube with the drive shaft inside it running from from the from the uh, differential all the way up to the gearbox, and then you just have a single universal joint at one end. And like the Riley, the, the, the back axle swings within its spring mountings. Um, at, the, at the end of it, by the gearbox, the, the drive shaft runs in a phosphor bronze bearing in the nose of it. And taking it apart, discovered this was badly worn. Um, but strangely, it was worn on one side rather than top and bottom, you think moving up and down. It would you know, be worn that way. But it was actually worn sideways on one side. Um, and I couldn't quite work it out. And then eventually I threw, I put a sort of laser level down there along the, um, along the, along the prop shaft tube, because you could sort of see when, when you unbolted it, uh, from the gearbox, it, it popped over at an angle like that. So I was thinking that the back axle was, was bolted in, in at an angle and it was, it was fighting it over. But when I actually fired the laser down the tube you could see that it was actually, actually the torque tube was bent so of course that was bent and then it was sort of straightened up and all that tension on that bearing was just the the prop shaft was just wearing it away on one side 
So I had to straighten the tube. So the way I'd done that was, oh, I've got it here, hang on. I've still got it, this. So I welded this bar up and um, that allowed me to put a uh, chain on each end, wrap the chains around the uh, torque tube um, and then suspend them with wires because you're fighting gravity so it's trying to fall down all the time. So support it on wires, chains around the uh, torque tube at each end and then a um, bottle jack in the middle and a block of wood resting against the torque tube with a shape to fit so it, it didn't didn't dent it in one place and um, then the good old oxyacetylene gently gently heating it took me took me a few few heating attempts and jacking and gradually moving it and moving it and, and following the laser level but eventually I, th I didn't think it was going to do it but managed to get it straight so great so change that bearing um, made some new bolts and castellated nuts for the um, for the universal joint housing and um, all back together on the ground took it out for a run and uh, yeah <laughs> yeah a a another sort of horrendous noise coming from the further back this time from the from the rear axle so uh, yeah back in that's why it takes so long they spend more time off the road than they do on the road but it's fun um, so jacked it back up and invest sort of to investigate this took the differential cover off and could see that the because uh, the noise sounded like sh sort of sheet metal rubbing on on something it was that that sort of noise it, it wasn't sort of solid metal against metal it was like Edge of edge of sort of sheet metal rubbing on something, and uh, looking into the, the rear axle, um, discovered that the, uh, the 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 differential bearings for the crown wheel were yeah they were knackered they they were they were worn and they dropped and what was happening the shields and the bearings were rubbing on the inner races. So then I really worried because. Um, I thought, where are you going to get bearings for a you know, 1927 Chevrolet in the UK? Um, so I took the bearings out and measured them. And miraculously, I mean, maybe uh, any Americans watching can, can um, suggest why this is, but they are actually metric um, bearings. So 1927, after the Second World War, reparation payments, was there a load of metric bearings kicking around you know that were sort of taken back from Germany and bunged in storage I, I don't know it's just 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 very strange but anyway it, um, it was to my advantage because um, one I decided to change the uh, roller bearings to taper bearings and I sort of looked at axles you know more modern axles and later axles and they all use taper bearings and I managed to find a, uh, and looked into a bit, and it was it was doable. Didn't seem a problem. So um, yeah, my local bearing suppliers they they had them on the shelf, so I just went and bought them, and um, got them back, heated them up in the uh, yeah in the uh, garage oven, and uh, popped them on, and then reassembled it all, set up the backlash, and set up the side to side play. Um, Bolted it all back together, sorted the oil leak, and um, took it out for a drive. Yeah, and this time no noise. So there it goes. It was all up and running. And, um, and then the next job to do wasn't really important, but the seat was very bouncy, uh, more bouncy than than it should be. And when I took the squab out, turned it upside down, uh, it, when it had been restored, somebody had used, God knows why, had used a piece of chipboard. Um, so chipboard's okay, but when you've got springs and that bouncing against it and damp and cold in the garage, it, it just it just sort of it had broken up. It had split in three places. So I uh, took the uh, unpinned all the all the cover, took all the springs off the board, cut a new piece of ply, and then um, reattached the springs, uh, string them all together, and um, 
and then covered in hessian and uh, foam and uh, reassembled it all and uh, yeah I'm quite, I'm quite pleased with the result it turned out turned out really well and uh, it was very comfortable when you were driving I described it as driving a fidgety armchair because it was bouncy there's no shock absorbers so it's very bouncy and uh, driving it was exciting especially cornering because you'd go into a corner and you'd never know which side of the road you'd bounce out on when you come out the other end. After about a year, finally got it running, starting on the button. Uh, it did always start, once it was sorted, it would always start on the button. And um, yeah, as you've seen in little videos, it ticks over lovely. I did also turn up a few little bits and bobs on the lathe. I made some um, knobs for the rocker covers. And, and the tops of the, um, the, the, the fold down roof uh, because they were nuts so you needed a spanner every time to either drop the roof down or when you oil in the rockers which needed like I say doing every 200 miles you had to find a spanner to take the rocker cover off so I made some uh, little aluminium thumb wheels that uh, made, made, uh, made, made servicing a lot easier I also turned up a nice little brass horn button because the button on there was uh, a little like it was off an old aerosol can or something so um, yeah it wasn't wasn't very good so on the lathe again just turn up a nice little brass brass button for the horn which was uh, yeah quite satisfying when when uh, pushed <coughs> also the uh, when parked up noticed that the radiator was sweating a bit down at the bottom um, and after a couple of little test runs it gradually started getting worse so uh, took the radiator off and um, cleaned the paint off and had a little look it had been repaired before so um, I sort of unpicked some of the, the, uh, the repairs uh, and made new repairs to the, the, the bottom of the radiator Um, so we, uh, the wife and I, we'd done a few, had a, went away for a pub lunch and a few uh, little local car shows. Um, uh, but I just, uh, driving it, I just decided that I needed something with uh, brakes on all four wheels um, because around where I live, the roads are quite fast and the drivers just aren't aware of, you know, vintage cars, what their capabilities or <laughs> their non-capabilities of stop, stopping quickly are. So, uh, so uh, Reggie, Reggie was, was moved on to fields further and is now, uh, now retired in Malta of all places. A nice chap called Tony bought it and um, we loaded it back into a Luton and um, off, off he went. So yeah, I hear from Tony occasionally. Uh, he's looking after it. Um, yeah, so that's the little story. So there you go, a little, uh, little brief overview of the, uh, the Chevrolet that uh, I had previous to the Riley. So that was my first foray into uh, vintage car ownership. Um, when, when, uh, when the Chevy moved on, I did purchase a Austin 7 Special with looks that only a mother would love, um, with the idea of uh, doing it up with my daughter, so you know, my daughter and I could uh, both drive it. But um, yeah, once I started work, delving into it and uh, working on it, it was just it was just so much work. She would have uh, sort of left home, had kids or, or dogs, as she keeps saying, um, and 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 sort of you know retired by the time I'd sort of had a chance to uh, get it up and running. So that again was um, yeah. So I decided, I think wisely, um, to to move that on and and then look, have a little breather, and then have a little and and then have a little look no I wasn't looking were you looking no I wasn't looking no I wasn't looking. I just found the advert so yeah I just happened to see the advert for the Riley and um, yeah I just thought I, um, I, I might go for that and um, over the years I've got quite wise buying cars buying second-hand cars um, and when I was young, I'd always buy with my heart. And, you know, I had some real heaps in my younger days. Loved them all. But, yeah, that, that was the era when cars you know, lasted sort of 15 years um, and just fell to pieces. 
And um, yeah, so went through a, a, a collection of, of old cars that just were constantly rusting. Um, so as the years got on, I got a bit wiser and um, yeah, my sort of uh, latest car purchases after the, over the past sort of 10, 20 years have, have been good. But it seems to be with vintage cars, I'm back right where I started, buying with my heart, not my head, and um, never learning. But, you know, that's all the fun of it. So, there you go. Uh, I hope you like this little, uh, little story of uh, the um, ownership of my Chevrolet. Um, sorry it was all photographs, but I did have video. Um, but as uh, sort of uh, memory storage is a premium, they, they've got dropped off. So I've just cobbled together what I had left. Um, yeah, so if you enjoyed this, liked it, give us a little like. Uh, just so I know you, you know, you're enjoying it. Um, there will be more stuff coming along. Um, yeah, yeah, I will get onto the Riley. Stop nagging. You're not my mother. Jenkins, I've told you before, don't stick your finger where it doesn't belong.